Thank you, guys. Uh, welcome to the second day of, of the talks. I'm delighted to be here from San Francisco. The weather is so much better here than it is in San Francisco. And I just want to take a couple of minutes to call out some very special people. I realize that PyData is the first, PyData Miami is the first conference. And I want to call out to Alex and, and Aaron and Mark and all the volunteers who have done a fabulous job in putting this together. So give them a big hand, guys. So thank you. I'm really excited to talk about MLflow, which is the uh, open source product that was actually, actually open source project that was created by Matej Zahar. He also happens to be the original uh, creator of Apache Spark to share with you what's it all about. You probably heard about machine learning cycle throughout the conference. So I wanted to share uh, what that's all about. And uh, hopefully, uh, you guys can also be part of this particular project, it being an open source. So we'd love to hear your feedback at the end and also um, take a survey so that way we can actually get an incredible feedback from all the machine learning uh, um, uh, data scientists and developers over here. A little bit about myself. Uh, I had the good fortune to work with some of the disruptors and some of the innovators, company in the Silicon Valley. Uh, most recently, I've sort of transitioned into being an advocate because I feel that you guys as developers are the new kingmakers and having the interaction with you to convey and converse with you is actually an important part of my job. And nothing pleases me more than to share some of the new things that actually emerge out of the open source community with people like you who actually make a difference. And I'm of conviction that innovation actually happens in collaboration, not in isolation. So I think it's important to have you as part of the community, hence the open source projects all around the world are taking a significant uptick in its contributions. Uh, this is what I'm gonna share with you for the next couple of uh, few minutes. I'll give you an overview of some of the challenges of what machine learning cycle are, which are kind of unique. They're different from your software development, edit, compile life cycle. And some of you probably live through it on a daily basis. And give you an idea how MLflow uh, tackles that. It's not something that's very unique, but it, it, it sort of gathered the information and gathered the, the, the mechanisms and, and the strategies from all these other projects and then combined them to that. But the important thing was that we want to do it in an open manner. And I think that's the important part of it, where, where you guys come into play. And I'll talk about briefly what the MFO components are and give you a developer experience of what is it like to use some of its API and hopefully share with you the roadmap where you guys can actually contribute and actually make a difference as well. And hopefully we might have some questions and answer. If not, just uh, um, corner me on the side, put a torch uh, to my head, and I'll ho ho hopefully take some feedback back to our engineering team. So I'll make an assertion that machine learning is, a level, is, is, is complex. And it is complex not so much because the algorithms behind it are difficult, or the math behind it is difficult, or the theory behind it is difficult. What's difficult about it is, is the evolution of the model and the iterative process, and the cumbersome way in which you have to track things to make sure that the model that emerges at the end of the cycle is something that you actually feel confident about deploying, and you feel confident in, in, its, in its metric and its evaluation and its, and its predictions. And that sort of introduces a lot of different parameters, a lot of changing things that actually happen in that entire life cycle. So if you look at your quintessential uh, machine learning cycle, this is something all of you probably do on a daily basis if you're building a model. The problem comes in because the fact that as a, as, as, as a, a developer or as a, as a data scientist, you want to use the best of the tools, you know, whether you're actually doing data preparations, whether you're using library for tuning, whether you're actually deployment in the environment that you want. And after you've deployed it, you actually want to monitor that. And these stages have its own challenges that you actually have to tackle with, that you have to address it in a manner that you feel that you use the best of the tools. So let's look at the first one. It's tuning. When you're preparing data, data comes from different sources. It comes in different format. It comes in, it's dirty. You actually have to do all the cleaning. You have to do all the feature engineering. You might be working with the data engineers to actually do that. But at the same time, you might be using databases. You might be using Kafka. You might be using Kinesis. You might be using some homegrown tool that you actually tune in a manner so that you actually get the data quite fast. So tuning is actually quite important, and you have to somehow Keep that in track. You have to remember that how you actually used it in case you have to reproduce the data. And that's actually changing. So first is tuning. Tuning also comes into, into, into place when you're actually training the model. 
You know, we talked about, I think if you actually attended uh, um, Zach Brown's talk yesterday, tuning is actually important because you, you want to change your regulation parameters. You want to do hyperparameter hyper switching. You actually want to do, change your learning rate to see how you can actually twist the needle. And that's the important part. Tuning comes into play in all the different algorithms and all the different machine libraries that you should learn. How do you track of all those things, right? Because you might have hundreds of experiments. You might have tuned the parameters very differently. So you have to tune them in a manner and you have to remember that. So the first one was um, configuration. The second one is tuning. The third is scale, right? Big data deals with scale. Your machine learning algorithm deals with scale. AI deals with scale. You talk about, you, you heard about what Clement talked about. It's all about data, right? The more data you have, the more confidence you have in your, in your training, and therefore you have, you have to be able to deal with scale. So scale actually has to, has to be an important part in your entire life cycle. You have to have an infrastructure that can actually take in a, a huge amount of training data and a huge amount of validation data so you can actually feel confident about your model. The third is deployment. You know, what do you do after you have trained this particular model? And after you want to hand it off to the DevOps people you want, to, you want to make sure that the model that you actually deployed is the one that you actually train with the right data, the train with the right hyperparameters tuning, you train with the same data, and you want, to, you want to be able to deploy it. So make sure that when you deploy it, when you're monitoring it, you're actually looking at, 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 at that, that in a scale. So those are sort of you know, some of the challenges you actually have to deal with. And then finally, you know, we are living in, in in what I would call the data zeitgeist of the world, where data really is an important part of it. And if you're, learning, if, you're, if you're living in Europe, GDPR is an important part of it, and governance is an important part of it. You heard yesterday from um, Xiao Hao that governance and provenance is an important part of it, and they are actually working on it. You heard about Jacob talk about the same thing, that governance is actually an important part, which is the tail end of your cycle, where you can actually do predictability, where you can actually do auditability. So these are all different life cycles, right, which is very different from your normal um, compile edit life cycle. And here's a validation of somebody who actually we worked with is one of the uh, uh, a very popular, um, I can't give the name of the company, but we shared when we were exploring what we can actually do with MLflow, we shared this idea with them. And he said, you know, we build hundreds and thousands of models a day. It's not only one language that we use. It's not only one framework that we use. It's not only one infrastructure that we use. We use the myriad set of tools. And we want to be able to reproduce that in a manner that I'm confident when I deploy that, I can move the needle. And that actually resonated quite a bit with a lot of developers is that we actually need that. So how do we, how do, we do that? And you might ask, Jules, hang on, what's the problem, right? If this is such a problem, and all of you are sitting over here doing things on a daily basis, then why? Why somebody actually hasn't done this? Why this problem hasn't been solved? It turned out it has, right? It's not that it hasn't been done. It's not that this is something new. It's not that we have come up with this idea. It is that people are actually have built all these custom frameworks. And they have. They've been the harbingers. They actually have put in standard. They've standardized how to do data preparation, how to do training, how to do deploy model. And it actually works great when you work with these companies. I remember an anecdote. Uh, I was running a, a Bay Area Apache Spark meetup, and I had this data scientist from Facebook who actually came over and gave a talk on how they do sentiment analysis on the news feed. And he gave a, a great presentation. And at the end of the talk, I asked him, you know, can you talk to whether you use uh, Apache Spark or whether you use MLlib, or you actually use your own machine learning libraries, um, or what infrastructure you use? And he was stumped. He couldn't answer the question. Not that he wasn't smart, he just couldn't answer the question because what the FB learner had abstracted all that, right? Had extracted all that and they had given him, or the data scientists who actually work, a declarative language in which they say, okay, I want, here's my data set, here is my declarative way I want to use it. I want to use this particular algorithm, I want to use logistic regression, I want to do classification, here's my validation data, here's my training, training data. You figure out, you create the model, you run it, when it's done, send me a notification, I'm done, right? So that's the level of abstraction, they do that. Michelangelo is another one where, where Uber actually produces and deploys model on a daily basis, and they will standardize the same thing. You know, they use the same mechanism about uh, data preparation, do the training and then deployment. Uh, Google TFX is, is another one. So what's wrong with that? I think the problem is, is when, you, when you leave the company, you lose that IP property, or you're stuck with an infrastructure, right? If I'm working at Google, 
and I'm very much used to the Borg. How many have heard about the Borg at Google? Right? Borg was the massive infrastructure in which they were actually doing scale. Now, when you think about scale, who do you think about? You think about Google, right? Because they deal with scale. So they had this particular infrastructure called Borg, whose grandchild is Kubernetes, which is an orchestration engine. But Borg was the one that actually allowed it. When people left Borg, I mean, people left Twitter, I mean, people left Google and went to work somewhere else, the first idea popped into the head was, God, I wish I had Borg with me because I could do all that. Same thing with the guy who actually like, left Facebook, said, I wish I actually had that particular infrastructure. So we thought that, what is it we can actually learn from this? But the key imperative for us was that we wanted to do it in an open manner with the community to make sure that they can choose the tools they want, they can choose the language they want, they can deploy, deploy it in the environment they want. If they move from one company A to company B, they take the intellectual property with them and they can reproduce that. And that is the benefit of doing things in an open manner. So how did we address that? Well, the answer was, we sat down with the community. We sat down with all these key stakeholders. We said, can we actually do this in an open manner? And that's what Matthias Arya and, and the engineering team and the rest of us, we actually sat down with these guys over a pub and drank lots of beers and said, OK, you know, let's, let's, let's sort something out. And that's what we came up. We said the imperatives would be that we should be able to use any libraries that we want. We should be able to run it anywhere, on my machine, because most of the developers do things on the machine. I should be able to run locally. I should be able to do it remotely. And the most important imperative is it has to be simple, it has to be easy to use, and the developer experience has to be phenomenal because you can't really get anything done if you don't please the developer because developers today are the king makers and I think it's very important to actually do that. And as a result of that, there were two design principles behind this. One was that we want to make sure that, that we provided the APIs to the developers just like the APIs have actually made a difference in the world. If you look at, go all the way to the history, if you look at Unix, how it actually proliferated as a platform to write application was because of its C simple interface to the application. You could actually write kernel libraries, you can actually write kernel modules, you can write window managers, but they're all built on top of this Unix interface. They had other tools, they had text, they had Yak, they had, uh, I'm dating myself, but that's what they actually had, right? These were, the, if you look at Java, how it actually evolved, it was because of the fact that they had Java APIs that you can actually write application on board of that. Look what happened to, um, because of that, you got Hadoop, you got now JVM that actually has given us Apache Spark. The Apache Spark library has been an appealing thing because it, because it was thought about as a developer first API. So we want to make sure that we actually give them the APIs, that when they build the models, when they deploy models, they can use REST, which is very simple. Um, you're, you're, not, you're, not, you're not tied to any particular platform language, just use HTTP protocol, or they can use command line uh, to, to do that. So that was the design philosophy, APIs is key. The second one was, we want to make sure that things were modular. And what I mean by modular, we didn't want to have an entire monolithic tool that you can actually use it. And if you don't use one part of it, you can't really use it. You have to use the entire thing. So we wanted to have the distinct and disparate tools that people can actually use, say, for example, tracking experiments. Or they can use, I just want to package my particular model and I want to deploy it. Or I just want to you know, uh, uh, do model management. So we want to make sure that, that they were distinctive and, and they could actually select any of the components that we actually have. So that was the imperative, and those are the principal components in, in, in the design philosophy that Mate and the group were actually thinking about. And so what are the components, right? So there are three very distinctive and selective components that any of you can actually use it. One is the ML4 tracking API. And the tracking allows you to record your experiments. You heard about Clement talk about today how you actually, experimentation is an important part of the life cycle. If you're running 1,000 experiments, how are you going to track all that? Right? If you're building, let's say, a language classification model, you, know, you might be tuning the parameters, you might be doing hyperceramic, you might be using all these different strategies to change the model. Each and every model that you actually run iteratively, you want to track exactly what went in and what went out. So that way, if you want to reproduce it, it's very easy to capture that. The second was, was the ability to actually capture the project in a such a way that it becomes a unit of execution independently. Right? Think about project as nothing but a, 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 a subset of a Docker file. We need to get a Docker file. You can actually deploy it anywhere you actually want, right? So that's that. That was that was it. The third one is the MLflow models, and models are different flavors of model you can actually use. So let me just give you a quick 
sort of illustration of what is life without the ML4 tracking API. Think about this particular pseudocode, right? If you didn't have a tracking API, what would you do? You would actually you know, build a particular model, you would compute the accuracy, and then you would actually use some sort of for loop to go and put that in, in a file somewhere, or capture that in a JSON file, and then, and then run you know, a thousand times. It becomes a bit cumbersome over time, right? If you have thousands of experiments, you know, how are you going to track that? You, know, you, you put this in a file, or you might put it in SQL, and you might put some tags so you can actually do searching. But it, be it be becomes a bit tedious. What if you expand? What about your input? What if your engrams change? Now you actually have to rerun again. What if you want to tune the parameters? Let's say your, um, your regular resin parameter is different. Let's say you actually have an additional parameter that you want to use to, to move the accuracy. You got to account for that. What if your library gets upgraded? Now you actually have to now rebuild everything and make sure that, that you run through the experiment. What if the version of the code actually changes? So these are the things that you actually had to worry about. And so we actually had to account all those things. And one of the things we actually decided to do that, that there should be a few key concepts in tracking that allows you to be able to monitor those concepts. One is parameters. Whenever you're actually doing uh, a modal management or modal uh, tracking, a modal experiment, you have certain parameters that you're going to use, right? You're going to have some metrics that you care about, you know, the accuracy, the loss, uh, your loss function, your, your prediction, all those area under the code, depending on what, what algorithm or what optimizers you actually use, they will have the metric. Each model might have its metric. Icarus has a metric, TensorFlow has its metrics. All the models that you actually use will have some sort of a, a metric that actually matters that, that's going to change the needle. You might have some tags and notes that you want to convey to the guy who's going to read the model, especially when you're handing off model to someone else. And the artifacts that you're going to store, the files that, that make up the model, the data, or the paths to the data where, where data is stored so you can reproduce the model, and the model type, you know, whether it was a TensorFlow model, whether it was a Keras, whether it was MLLib, whether it was uh, Scikit-Learn, all these different models that you want to care about. And finally, the source code that actually went into it. Now, if you take this one step forward, and if you use the ML API, uh, it's very simple. You just import MLflow, pip install MLflow. And this happens to be a Python code that's using TensorFlow. And I just use the, with, uh, with the, the, the standard complex statement with start run. And now I'm actually doing the, and I'm tracking the experiments. I'm just you know, uh, uh, putting my parameters in. I'm putting my metrics in. And finally, I'm logging the model, which means this is going to be a TensorFlow model. It is that simple, really. The tracking is, is that simple. All the work is actually done for you. So if you take that algorithm before, that you were using JSON file and printouts, and you use the ML flow, it just becomes very easy. Right? You just import the statement. Now you use the log parameters to do that. And then once you have actually logged the parameters, you can actually use ML flow for tracking, for tracking UI. So that's actually what happens is that you, you can actually go into your, into, in, into your ML flow UI and actually find out what metrics were logged, what the model looks like. Uh, what, when was the model run? Who was it run by? What does your model flavor look like? All that is actually given to you because of tracking. And tracking can be done on two days. You can actually have a tracking server that's running remotely, or you can have a tracking server by default when you do pip install that runs locally under a directory called ML runs. And when you, when you say MLflow UI, it's going to launch a Flask UI and give you the ability to actually do that. And that's actually governed by your environment variable where we actually have the tracking server running. So you can use the UI to look at the experiment in a very tabular manner. You can compare, you can compare the metrics of you know, model one versus model two, and you say, OK, I like this model. I'm going to use that. I'm going to deploy it. Or you can actually use that programmatically. So that sort of, in, in essence, is tracking. The second thing was the motivation was project. We wanted to make sure that one of the principal propositions behind, as I alluded earlier, was that we want to be able to use all this different diverse set of tools. Right? We want to give the data scientist or the ML developer or the developer to the best tools that he or she wants to use, the best language they want to use. Now, each of these libraries has its own format to store the model. Right? Now, if you actually try to encapture all the different models, we would have n by n um, uh, problem, right? because we have to support all that. It's not very different from what Clement said earlier this morning, that the reason they went to Apache Arrow was because they wanted to have Arrow, Apache Arrow as the unifying thing that, 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 that's, that's um, common to all the different libraries so they can actually just use that. So we actually came up with this idea about ML4 project. It's really a packaging format. We just encapture what your project looks like, what the dependencies are, what is it you actually need to run it, 
and we just create a simple file. It's very similar to a Docker file. And so the project essentially encaptures the specification so you can actually run it locally and execute it remotely. And the project file just looks very simple. It's just a, a, a directory on your GitHub that has your Conda environment that says, if I'm going to deploy this particular model and somebody wants to run this model, what they will need? They will need the Conda environment, and the Conda will recreate, just like the Python virtual environment, you'll recreate your environment in this particular sandbox, and those are the entry points for your program. I can have parameters uh, that, that, that's going to run, whether it's my Python uh, main function, that's an entry point to the model, or it could be anything else, right? It could be a Java code, it could be you know, some shell script that you're actually running to do some authentication, and then giving, a <clears throat> giving it to the Python to run it. And it's very simple. I can actually use ML4 run git hub to my project and then give the parameters that I want. The default parameter is 1.0, but I can actually give a different parameter and it will actually run that and will create an experiment and then you'll be able to see, oh, with these tuning parameters, this is the results I got. So not only you as a developer who actually created the original experiment, you can actually share it with the rest of the community through the git project that's currently where it is with different parameters and they can actually run it independently and share it. So that's the gist behind project. And then finally, I talked about models, right? Because we wanted to have distinct models. And one of the reasons we want to have this because we want to be able to support all this particular model. And we captured the model as a flavor. We say this is going to be a Python, uh, a Py function, or this is going to be a TensorFlow model, or a Keras model, or a scikit-learn, or MLlib. And we captured that information so that we can actually deploy it anywhere that we actually want where we're actually running Python or where it understands that this is a, a TensorFlow model and I'm running on Kubernetes, so I'm just going to load that TensorFlow model using the API and do the predict function. And if you look at the project file, I mean the model file, it's very simple. Each run has a unique ID, the time you actually create, and the flavor that we actually support. So if it's a TensorFlow model, that's, it will say that this is actually TensorFlow and the directory is estimator and there is a, a f function called predict that I'm going to use once I load the model and give the data that I need to get my predictions. And if I'm using a Python function, I'll load that as a PyFunk. And if I'm deploying to Apache Spark, I can actually use that as a UDF. That's sort of, in essence, what the model flavor are. And it is, again, very similar to what I would say, you know, sort of a Docker file. It, it, it encapsulates that. And that's sort of the, the, the reason behind model. So now you have three distinct models. We talked about the tracking. We talked about the encapsulation and capturing the model in a unit of executions. You can reproduce it. Because the important part is you want to reproduce it with the parameters that you actually saved. And those were the ones that you actually saved. And it's going to run it. Whatever experiment ID that you provide, it's going to pick up the parameters that you actually saved and then recreate the environment. So you know with certain amount of certainty that given a model that you created, last week, the parameters that you use, the tuning parameters that you use, will be able to reproduce that. So that essence is, is what it is. So I want to now sort of switch a little bit and, and, and show you how you can actually do that in, in, in code. And if you want to take a picture of these, I have all the URLs available. This is where the, uh, the code is, and that's where the Git repository where I have the IMD classifier that I'm going to use. And the essence is that I'm going to use I'm going to create three experiments, right? The experiments are going to be, uh, did somebody miss that? I'm going to publish this slug and put it on PyData, so if you hear that, all right? And in fact, the, uh, the guys actually have it. Oops. So I'm creating three models, right? We have a base, baseline model. We always have a baseline model that we want to compare that. We're going to create experiment one with all the different parameters. And then, and then we're going to use experiment two. And then we'll find out which one is the best, and we'll try to deploy it and see how it works, how much time I have. 10 minutes, okay, I'll run through it quickly, all right? So let's switch a little bit over here. One caution, never drink beer the night before you're giving a presentation. <laughs> Jeff, don't have happy hours the night before. Okay. So this is my particular notebook, oh my goodness. Now I think I only have 10 minutes, I'm not gonna run this experiment, I have a pre-run experiment, and believe me, this actually works. Um, because it's gonna, I only have 10 minutes, I wanted to make sure. So what I have over here <clears throat> is a Keras model that's doing, doing a sentiment analysis. And this is the model that actually takes the IMDB set. By the way, if you haven't got this particular book by Francois Cholet, get it. It's probably the best Python book on, on, on uh, uh, deep learning. 
And I'm using IMDb sets, uh, which have about 50,000 reviews. And just like the MNIST data set, I can just load the data in. And everything actually has been vectorized for me, so I don't have to go through creating tensors for my word deck and my weights. All that is actually given to it. And so I'm just going to use that particular modal experiment. And all, all over here, I'm just importing uh, my MLflow, my IMD classifier, and all the libraries that I'm using it, because I'm using a Keras, and the underlying, uh, the underlying thing is the TensorFlow engine and the version that I have. And these are all my modules that I actually need. I have an, uh, an MFLOW client, which is your handle to anything they actually want to do the tracking server. I just run some you know, query experiments to find out. <clears throat> and this is my model that I actually created. So my, first, my first model is this one over here, which actually takes in the baseline is 16 units. I'm going to run through 20 epochs. I'm going to have a binary uh, classifier. And then my output is going to be uh, the output from the sigmoid function. Each layer actually uses a ReLU. And the final one is a sigmoid function. And it gives them the probability of whether this is um, um, uh, a good review or a bad review. And I'm going to run three experiments. And when you run the first experiment, it's going to go down to the Amazon, download the leap. It'll, it will run through 20. It will create a <clears throat> A, a TensorFlow or TensorBoard event, so I can actually manage the event. It's going to log all the events and everything. I'll run it for a while. And you can believe me, I actually ran it just um, last night. Um, and then I'm going to run the experiment number two. Experiment number two is actually changing the epochs and changing the hidden layer. And one of the things that Francois recommends that if you actually would do the experiment, maybe change the, the, the number of dense layers you have. Maybe change the input of the parameters that you're actually going to put the neuron. Uh, change maybe the, 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 the uh, uh, ReLU function or the optimizer function. Use something else. Instead of using binary cross simply use MSE. So we're going to do that with the first, second one. And with the second experiment, I'm going to use now the hidden layer to be 3. I'm going to use my epochs to be 20. My output, I'm going to change it to 32. And my loss function is going to be MSC. And I use with the regularization parameter 0.0. .0. And I'm run that experiment. And it's going to go through all that. And it'll give me my accuracy and all that. Right? All this is actually tracking on the, on the UI. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'll go over to my UI. And I have three experiments. Right, I've got. The first one, uh, ran, the last one with MSC, and the two ones that in each, each of these actually have their accuracy. So what I want to do is I'm going to compare. That's not what I wanted. So I created it, and I'm going to compare those three to see which one is the best one. So I'm going to compare that. And I can use that to compare all my experiments, right? So over here, I, I get a nice little uh, column diagram that says, these are the parameters that you actually used. You know, these are the metrics that you actually care about. And I can actually figure out which one is actually better. So for example, I care about the validation loss. And we can see that the validation loss for this one was comparable, so probably it's not the best one. I can actually look at the, uh, the, the validation loss for this. I mean, the, those accuracy, the validation loss for this one. And I realized that the MSC actually gave me the best results, right? So I'll probably choose that just for experimentation. If I can get 90% accuracy in my sentiment analysis, I'm happy with that, right? So we'll choose that particular model as, as the one that we actually have. I can go in there and actually look at the individual experiment and see you know, how did the artifacts look like. I have images over here. And I can say, well, this was my baseline. Uh, thing that I actually use Plotlib to actually create that. And I stored that as part of it. So you can actually go in there and, and look at all the artifacts that you have. And you can actually see that it's beginning to sort of overfit at, the end, at, at about you know, five e epochs. So you have an idea of how, how, your, how your curves looks like. And I can compare that with the, um, with the experimental uh, UI to see, well, you know, is, is, my, is my validation accuracy tracking along with the training? Am I seeing overfitting? Am I seeing underfitting? So you can actually see the trend. And you can actually do all that. And then finally, once you realize that, OK, I really care about the 89% the, the uh, accuracy for my MSC optimizer, and I know the loss is very, very small, so I'm, I'm getting a good accuracy, I'm going to use that particular model to go ahead and deploy it. And then I'm going to use that predictions. So we'll go ahead and, by the way, you can actually also use TensorFlow, right? So I was, I was using TensorFlow. I'm in TensorBoard. You can actually go in TensorBoard to look at all the images. So that's what TensorBoard looks like. I can actually look at my graphs. All right, we keep on going. 
And I'm gonna, I can reproduce the experiment. And the, the way I reproduce the experiment is, is I know the UID, right? And it's running on the tracking server, and I know where my tracking server is. I'm just making a REST call to say, go in and you know, load this particular experiment, and then do some predictions. So I, I read all these experiments, and I give a particular uh, prediction, say, you know, this is a five-star movie, awfully good movie. I would recommend it. What do you think is going to happen? There was a talk here yesterday by Chen Hao who said, one of the reasons why LSTM does a better job or a recurrent network do a better job because they keep track of the memory. So what do you do when you actually have a context like that? Right? This is a five-star movie, awfully good. Right? But if awful is also connoted as a bad one, it's probably going to get confused because this is not a very sophisticated model. The word WEC is just keeps, keeps a track of the frequency of the word count. So what do you think it's going to get? I do a prediction and I get about... Oh, I lost my. Um, I get about 0 0.5, right? It's not, it wasn't quite sure, but if I, when I ran this thing over here, which says this is this is a great movie, I get 0 0.8. How much time do I have? Two minutes, okay. And then if I have a bad movie that says this is an awful movie, and it predicted right, Bird Box was scary, and and I got the 0 0.2, right? So you can actually do that in real time with it, where people are, you look in the click stream, you've deployed this particular model, you're happy with the MSC, but then you begin to realize that you know, there's something wrong over here. You know? I mean, that is a perfect sentiment analysis of saying, you know, this is an awfully good movie. Right? Or if I send something like, this is dope, man. What is it going to do? Right? That's, that's not grammatically correct English, but it's being used. I've seen you know, advocates tweeting, this is dope. I've seen Andrew Ng saying, this is dope. Man, you should try it out. Well, what do you do then? Right? So you have to somehow use another algorithm. And so one of the experiments you can actually do is, okay, what do you think the next algorithm would be to make sense over here? I used your, 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 your typical first text analysis, you know, TFID, or I can use WordWAC. What would be the next experiment that I would want to conduct? Anybody? Zach, you can't answer that question. I could use you know, recurrent network. I can use you know, LSTM. So that would be my next experiment. I would go the same process. I would log all the, uh, all the stuff. So that, so in essence, is, is your, your MFLOW in a nutshell. Very easy to use. You just import the libraries. You, uh, the, the three kinds of APIs. You got Python, you got Java, and you got um, um, R as well. And then going back and um, finishing up my presentation, So basically, you know, this way we are right now. Uh, we just released a 0 0.8 version over here that actually has a lot of faster and improved area because if you're using thousands of experiments, you won't be able to look at the experiments quite easily. You won't be able to search the experiments by parameters because if you have people who have run thousand experiments, you won't be able to do that. You'll be able to use the tags to do the searching. So that has been improved. We have extended the Python model. So if you actually, let's say you need MLlib or you use ML, uh, uh, um, scikit-learn and you want to store it as an, as an, as an MLlib flavor, and now you actually want to use that as a Python UDF, so you can actually provide arguments. Um, you can actually deploy that as Spark UDF. And then other dependencies on Conda. Now we actually store the Conda, Conda uh, environment within the model so that it captures how you can actually reproduce that. And we're looking for uh, your contribution, how you can actually get involved. Try it. Pip install, get started. Your documentations are great. We have loads and loads of code examples. Um, contribute. Go to the GitHub MFLOW. Pull a request. You know, if you see something that's actually missing that you are using on a daily basis that we have not addressed it, we want to hear from you. And I think that's why I'm here to actually share this with the Python community because Python is one of the first class APIs and this is actually a great simple API to actually use to do your tracking and the rest of the sub. We have a Slack channel for you to you know, vent your frustrations. And then we actually have an ML4 survey that Matea Zaharia put together and sort of gave an idea of what's actually coming up in 2019. And we want you to take the particular survey, and that gives us a great feedback of what other things you know. I know a lot of people I had a chat with yesterday and over the course of two days have sort of expressed you know, some of the frustrations, some of the lemons uh, that, that I think are important. And we want to capture that. We want to make sure that you 
are an important part of the committee because this is an open source project, right? This is not proprietary, and you can actually make a difference. And we're actually making a difference. We probably might be releasing 1.0 imminently, probably by February. Um, but file a pull request, PR request, we will look at it. Uh, we, we're very important. We actually have three big contributions. R was a completely community effort, right? We didn't have an R API, but the guys at our studio said, we have a lot of data scientists who use R API. We're going we're gonna to do a pull request. So they actually wrote, wrote an MNA client, and they're fully integrated with R. Um, Java is the same thing, was, was, was a community. Uh, we started with Python. There was no other, uh, other API. And some guys say, hey, you know, I'm a Java coder. I don't want to use Python or Scala as anything. I say, all right, let's file a pull request. And they did that. We have an MFO client that actually uses Java. And we are working with Conda to support Java so they can reproduce that, right? A JVM and all that. And so anything that you actually see, please share with us. And so in a nutshell, you know, this is what I talked about. It's light. It's very distinctive. You can actually select the components that you actually want to use. The important thing is you can develop locally and you can remotely uh, do the experimentation. You can do it in the cloud. You can do it on premise, which, again, sort of reaffirms my early assertions that we wanted to do this in an open manner. And the only way we can actually do it in an open manner is that don't tie anything to a particular infrastructure. Don't tie anything to the vendor. Do it in open source that all of you can actually use it whenever you want, however you actually want to use it. Now, those are sort of aspirations thing. You know, but let's choose the common, let's be pragmatic, let's choose the common APIs that are being used by all of you so we can actually make that part of it. And uh, if San Francisco is on a bucket list, I'm the program chair. Um, do come. There's 15% discount for you guys. And uh, hopefully to see you um, in sunny, or oh, well, wintry San Francisco in April. It won't be as pleasant as this one. So thanks a lot. I'll, I'll, do we have any questions? So, so we're actually out of time for questions. Just want to make sure everybody else has their, their opportunity to speak. So you can find Jules. You're hanging out for lunch? I'm, I'm going to hang out. You know, okay. just... And he has a tutorial tomorrow morning as well, a different topic. Yeah, I'm, I'm also giving a tutorial tomorrow. So hold the PyTorch to my head, and hopefully I'll be able to answer your question.